Committee will come back to order. Uh, we'll now recognize the second panel. We have Mr. Todd Zawicki, uh, is the Foundation Professor of Law at George Mason University. Dr. David S. Evans is the Chairman of the Global Economics Group and Lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School. Mr. Adam J. Levitin is Associate Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center. Mr. Andrew Pincus is a partner at Meyer Brown, Rowe and Ma LLP. And with that, uh, we, uh, as is uh, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses are sworn before they testify. If you'll stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, have a seat. Uh, the record will will reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, in order to facilitate discussion, if you can, uh, uh, your, your written uh, statement will be admissible to the record, and um, you can just simply summarize simple five minutes, and at one minute you'll get the yellow light, which sort of helps you round up, and uh, would love to hear your testimony. Mr. Zawicki, we'll start with you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I want to say at the outset that um, I, uh, I, I was in favor and remain in strongly in favor of uh, regulatory reform dealing with consumer financial uh, uh, protection and that sort of thing. Um, I think that we've been much in need of regulatory reform, streamlining, coherence, um, and that sort of thing. And uh, to this day, I remain uh, disappointed that I think with the CFPB, we've uh, squandered a golden opportunity to uh, create new useful safeguards for consumers that would promote competition, consumer choice, and consumer protection simultaneously. Instead, what I think is we've uh, uh, created a, uh, um, a, a monster of an agency that is going to uh, uh, reduce access to credit, increase the cost of credit, and uh, ironically, um, have the unintended consequence of probably exposing more consumers to fraud and abuse in the, uh, when it comes to lending products. The Truth in Lending Act was three pages long. Now um, it's grown to thousands and thousands of pages. We've seen duplicative regulatory uh, 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 enactments over time, and in particular, years of class action litigation, um, uh, heavy-handed regulation legislation have uh, larded up the, uh, uh, the current uh, system with a lot of counterproductive regulation, and unfortunately this isn't going to change that. This bureau is simultaneously the most powerful and unaccountable bureaucracy uh, that I've ever been aware of. Um, it is an independent agency within another independent agency inside the, uh, uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, it may be the most powerful that's ever been considered by most to be constitutional. Um, it has the power to reach every single credit card, payday loan, mortgage in America. Uh, it has the potential to impact small businesses that use um, uh, consumer credit and personal credit in their operations. Yet, an agency with this kind of powers presided over by one person with, uh, with no effective external oversight, a completely unreviewed and unreviewable budget, um, and uh, um, uh, and really no checks on them except for this uh, loose check by the, uh, the FSOC. Now, history tells us what happens when we give bureaucrats this much unaccountable power to regulate massive swaths of the economy. This super regulator is like something that we haven't seen since the Nixon administration. And there's a good reason why we haven't seen this since the Nixon administration, is we know what happens when we give this sort of unaccountable power to our bureaucrats to make decisions for consumers as to what kind of, uh, what kind of products they're allowed to have and what the terms of those products are, are going to be. It is, a, as I mentioned, a one-person commission. I think it seems obvious that this should be a commission rather than a, uh, a one-person sort of uh, thing. I also agree with the proposal to uh, reduce the two-thirds supermajority oversight to a, a simple majority rule for, uh, for oversight. Um, failing that, or perhaps in addition to that, I think that this should be formally uh, required to undergo some sort of external review by uh, OIRA or, uh, or someone else rather than what I take to be the, uh, um, the really toothless cost-benefit analysis that's included here. And we saw, during, and the reason we haven't seen this since our, the Nixon administration is we saw what happened when we give this kind of 
uh, unaccountable power to bureaucrats. We saw a generation of, of uh, uh, economic stagnation, stifled innovation, declining American competitiveness, and the like. And it is completely predictable this is what happens to bureaucracies when they lack the feedback and the accountability from outside. You get tunnel vision, mission creep, um, and you get uh, the pet hobby horses of whoever the person is who happens to be running the organization is the one who sets the, uh, the priorities. This is, and what we learned from that experience and the harm it did the American economy is that we need accountability, oversight, and transparency in our, our processes. Why does that matter? Because overregulation by this body could inflict huge harm on the American economy. It will, it will raise cost and reduce uh, access to credit. I'm not familiar with any theory that says that increasing the cost of a business could possibly cause prices to go down. Um, uh, and it will increase the cost and reduce access to credit. And what we've learned over time is that you simply cannot wish away the need for credit. That if somebody needs $500 to repair their transmission to get to work on Monday, they need $500 to repair their transmission to get to work on Monday. Um, what should be done, I lay out in, my, uh, in my, uh, my statement, which is the model here is the Federal Trade Commission, a multi-member commission with internal checks and balances. One reason that independent agencies typically are not subject to eye review is precisely because they are commissions that have an internal deliberative process. This agency will not be subject to any budget oversight. It is not a uh, multi-member commission. It is not subject to external review by OIRA or anybody else. And I think that this needs to be fundamentally uh, reviewed. Thank you for t testimony, Mr. Zawicki. And uh, Dr. Evans, uh, you have five minutes. Chairman McHenry, a Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you very much for asking me to testify on the CFPB. Um, shortly after the U.S. Department of the Treasury proposed the CFPA Act, uh, Professor Josh Wright from George Mason and I started studying the legislation um, and the rationales being put forward for it. Uh, early last year, we published an extensive study on the proposed agency. Uh, based on our research, uh, I'm quite concerned that the CFPB could make it harder and more expensive for consumers to borrow money. Uh, and for small businesses who often rely on credit cards uh, and other lending products. Uh, just because someone puts the words consumer protection in the title of an administrative agency uh, doesn't mean that's what it's going to do. Uh, there are two reasons, in my view, to believe that the CFPB uh, be could become an anti-lending and borrowing bureau that could harm consumers and small businesses and ultimately reduce economic growth. Um, the first is that there's an anti-borrowing bias built into the CFPB. Uh, Professor Warren co-authored a long article in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review in late 2008 um, that laid out the rationale for the new agency and its agenda in some detail. Uh, she claimed that consumers aren't rational when it comes to borrowing money, uh, that consumers make lots of mistakes, and consumers end up, in the end, uh, borrowing too much. Uh, Professors Barr, uh, Molly Nathan, and Shafir uh, wrote an article that proposed very intrusive government regulation uh, for financial services. Uh, that included requiring lenders to offer plain vanilla products uh, as a default. Now, while the Treasury, Professor Barr uh, was involved in drafting the CFPA and Professor Mullenathan was just appointed uh, to Assistant Director for Research at the CFPB. Uh, Professor Wright and I have reviewed the intellectual foundations of the CFPB based on the writings of the people uh, behind its creation. Uh, the view that people don't really know what they're doing when they borrow money and that we need to protect consumers from themselves has really become part of the genetic code of the CFPB. Uh, unfortunately, at least in the writings that have provided the foundation for the new agency, uh, there's little recognition of the fact that consumer lending has really improved the lives of millions of people and it's spurred job growth in this country. Now, the CFPB has the tools to put the highly interventionist agenda described in these foundational papers into effect. And that's the second reason I'm concerned. That this new agency can ban, quote, unquote, abusive lending products. Uh, what those are are pretty much left up uh, to the discretion of the head of the CFPB. Uh, the new agency can also steer financial services companies uh, towards offering plain vanilla products designed by the CFPB by either by banning products that don't conform to the CFPB's view or by making it legally risky and expensive for lenders uh, to deviate too far from the products that the CFPB wants. I understand plain vanilla was excised from the language, uh, but there is still the possibility of, in effect, doing it. Uh, through prohibitions, disclosure requirements, and fines, uh, the CFPB has the means to place a heavy thumb on consumer lending products that consumers and small businesses 
would willingly consume and the financial services companies would willingly offer. There is no dispute that some lenders act very badly and that we need consumer protection. Uh, the proponents of the CFPB have made some real contribution, I think, to our understanding of some of the problems and some of the possible solutions. And I have a lot of respect uh, for their passion and their intellect. Uh, but regulation needs to be based on a balanced view of the benefits as well as the costs of lending and borrowing. In fact, most consumers and small businesses are responsible, and most consumers and small businesses don't get into trouble. Uh, over the last several decades, the fraction of consumer loan debt that banks have had a write off has varied from about uh, 1.5 to 3.0 percent. Um, charge offs for consumer loans rose during the recent very deep recession, uh, but they are now coming back down to that low level. Uh, most lenders provide products that people want and that people benefit from. There are serious risks to the economy of restricting consumer credit. Let me just focus on one of them. Uh, between 1992 and 2005, brand new small businesses generated an average of 3 million jobs a year. Access to consumer credit can make or break those entrepreneurs. Many of them use personal credit cards for financing. In fact, the founders of some of our greatest companies, Google, for example, had to max out their credit cards to stay afloat in the early days. Over time, a heavy regulatory thumb on credit availability could therefore pose a significant drag on employment and economic growth. In closing, I would counsel the subcommittee to ensure that the CFPB has leadership that is balanced and that recognizes the great value that lending products provide for consumers and small businesses as well as the occasional problems. I would also suggest that Congress keep watch over the CFPB to ensure that it doesn't become the anti-lending and borrowing bureau and harm the very consumers that it was put in power to protect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, Mr. Levitin, you are recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, members of the subcommittee, my name is Adam Levitin. I am a professor of law at Georgetown University. My research focuses on consumer finance and financial regulation. I am not here representing any financial interest or to plead the interest of banks or trade groups. Instead, I am here as an expert on consumer finance and as a scholar whose work is deeply concerned with the financial security of American families. I am happy to discuss the CFPB's regulatory structure and how it compares with other Federal bank regulators. I do so in detail in my written testimony. I am also happy to address unfounded concerns that the CFPB will crimp the availability of sustainable credit. It is frankly premature to speculate on this, but I would note that the CFPB is required by statute to do a cost-benefit analysis on prohibitions of uh, financial products. I am also happy to make the case, as I do in my written testimony, that the CFPB is more accountable than any other Federal bank regulator, period. But I think it is important that we all be honest about what is going on here. This hearing really isn't about improving the CFPB or ensuring that there is sufficient oversight. Those would both be laudable goals. But the CFPB hasn't even gotten up and running yet. And by all accounts, the CFPB transition team, led by Professor Warren, is doing an outstanding job. There is simply nothing that suggests that there is an oversight problem that needs to be addressed. Instead, this hearing is part of an attempt to hobble the CFPB and render it ineffective because there simply aren't the votes to kill it off outright. This is about politics, not oversight, unfortunately. And there is no clearer proof of this uh, than the testimony, written testimony of Mr. Pincus here on my left on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Pincus expresses concerns that the CFPB's structure leaves it vulnerable to uh, regulatory capture. Regulatory capture is the phenomenon of a regulatory agency advancing the interest of the industry it regulates rather than the public interest. The typical story of regulatory capture is the oil industry capturing the minerals man management service or Wall Street capturing regulators like the OCC or the Fed. As Representative Baucus put it, Washington and the regulators are there to serve the banks. So this leaves me wondering, who does the Chamber fear will capture the CFPB? Is it the multitude of well-financed consumer groups that have shown themselves to be the terror of Capitol Hill? Is it middle-class citizens, military families, seniors? I am really quite perplexed by it. And I find it very strange for the Chamber of all entities to express concerns about capture, because regulatory capture is the Chamber's signature mode of operation. Perhaps the Chamber is simply worried that it won't be able to capture the CFPB and that the CFPB won't be the lapdog of Wall Street but will be a real financial watchdog. That the Chamber is sounding the alarm about regulatory capture reveals the various CFPB reform proposals for what they really are, naked attempts to gut the CFPB and render it ineffective because there aren't the votes to kill it outright. That is the same reason some members of this subcommittee want to put the CFPB under the regular appropriations process. Because if you don't have the votes to kill off an agency, you can starve it to death via appropriations by playing hostage with the Federal budget. So let's be frank about what this hearing is about. 
This is about banks versus families. The issue presented by this hearing is whether Congress cares more about increasing the profits of banks or protecting the financial security of American families. Which is more important, banks or families? Turning to the so-called reform proposals, one would replace the single CFPB director with a five-person commission. Put differently, the bill proposes paying five people to do one person's job. Where I come from, that's called government waste. What's more, by having five people do one person's job, accountability is diminished and leadership becomes less effective. Policy ends up getting set by horse trading among the commissioners, rather than by exacting analysis of the issue at hand. There's little evidence that a five-person commission provides a meaningful check against agency overreach. And if a single director is good enough for the OCC, it's good enough for the CFPB. Put another way, if a single director is good enough for an agency that protects large banks, then it's good enough for an agency that protects American families. Another so-called reform proposal would lower the threshold for the Financial Stability Oversight v uh, Council to veto CFPB rulemakings. It would require a veto if a CFPB rulemaking were inconsistent with bank safety and soundness. Now, bank safety and soundness is a technical term. It means profitability. Let me repeat that. Bank safety and soundness means bank profitability. It's axiomatic that a bank can only be safe and sound if it is profitable. But consumer protection is often at loggerheads with bank profits. The only reason to engage in predatory lending, for example, is because it's profitable. It's not done out of spite or malice. What this means is that any CFPB rulemaking that affected bank profitability would therefore be inconsistent with safety and soundness and thus be subject to a veto. Thus, under this proposal, both the Credit Card Act of 2009 and Title 14 of the Dodd-Frank Act, which reforms the mortgage lending industry, could not be implemented because they would affect bank profitability and thus be inconsistent with bank safety and soundness. Congress established the CFPB to protect, to protect American families, not maximize bank profits. Let us let the CFPB have a chance to do its job. Thank you, Mr. Levitin. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Pincus, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Quigley and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify before the subcommittee today on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and the hundreds of thousands of businesses at the chamber that the chamber represents. Let me at the outset correct Mr. Levitin's apparent misperception about what the chamber's uh, long-held position has been on this issue. Uh, through the debate over Dodd-Frank, uh, the chamber made clear that it strongly supported sound consumer protection regulation and enhanced consumer protection at the Federal level. The Chamber businesses, just like consumers, have a strong interest in a marketplace that is free of fraud and free of other deceptive and exploitative practices so legitimate businesses can compete on a level playing field. So businesses, just like consumers, don't like uh, predatory practices that hurt consumers. At the same time, what is essential is to ensure that regulation does not impose duplicative and unjustified burdens that have two ill effects. First of all, they unjustifiably divert resources that are essential to fueling economic growth to complying with rules that are not necessary. And in this context, as Mr. Zawicki has mentioned, uh, they prevent small businesses from obtaining the credit they need to expand and creating the jobs that our economy needs because the well-documented fact is that small business credit is often consumer credit. And misguided regulation of consumer credit that shrinks its availability will shrink the credit that is the lifeblood of small businesses in this country. So the Chamber actually looks forward to working with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau once it is up and running to meet these goals and has already uh, had several productive meetings with some of the people that have been designated to take roles at the Bureau. But the Chamber is concerned that the Bureau's structure will make it impossible to achieve the goals that have been set out for it. Um, first of all, I, I think it is important to make clear at the outset, given some of the earlier testimony, that the plain fact is that Dodd-Frank sets up for the Bureau an unprecedented structure that consolidates more power in the director than in the head of any other agency that regulates private individuals and entities. I just want to repeat that again. It concentrates more power in a single person than any other Federal agency head of an agency that regulates private individuals and entities. So let me talk a little bit about why that is so and, and, and uh, compare, address some of the comparisons that uh, were put on the table earlier. First of all, I think we are all familiar with the, the basic model of a Federal agency, like the Federal departments. They are headed by a single individual, a secretary or the head of the FDA 
one individual, but there are two important characteristics there. It is one individual who serves at the pleasure of the President. The President has total power to, uh, to uh, fire that person if he or she disagrees with the President's policy views. And, of course, for all those executive agencies, the appropriations process is there and Congress reviews their appropriations. Now, we do have independent agencies. The structure for independent agencies virtually uniformly throughout the government is that they are headed by a multi-member bipartisan commission whose members first serve for fixed terms. So there is a built-in compromise there. Yes, it is true the President doesn't have the unfettered power to fire uh, a member of the FTC or the SEC, but neither does one of those people have all the power to run the agencies. You need a majority. And so there is a built-in check on the power of any one of those individuals who have protection against uh, the President's discretionary firing. Second of all, for most all of those agencies, there is still the appropriations process oversight to ensure that there is a second check on what they are doing through the people's elected representatives in the House and in the Senate. The Bureau, of course, is headed by a single director who serves for a fixed term and with respect to whom the President is limited in his ability to uh, fire him except for cause, him or her except for cause, and there is no appropriations oversight. So it is those three things coming together, single person, limitation on the President's power to fire except for cause, and no appropriations oversight that makes this different than any other agency. And I want to address the OCC comparison because that has been uh, floated earlier again in the hearing. The OCC controller is someone who is subject to uh, firing at the discretion of the President. So again, critical difference in the checks and balances that exist with respect to that agency and uh, the agency here. And as I detail in my testimony, the Secretary of Treasury also exercises some oversight authority over the controller. Finally, just two quick additional points. First of all, the question of the FSOC review of regulations and whether that is unique. I served in the executive branch. The OIRA regulatory review process within OMB. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm running over a little bit. The OIRA process brings all of the executive agencies around the table to reach a compromise about what a, a united view about what that executive branch agency regulation should be. Second of all, I'd be happy to talk more about the regulatory capture point that Mr. Levitin made, but suffice it to say that uh, the banks are not the only special interest in this debate. There are lots of special interests. And the question is, how do we create a structure that makes sure that the resulting rules are the public interest and not the product of one special interest or another? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pincus. Thank you for your testimony. And I thank all of you for, uh, for, for waiting and being here and uh, uh, understanding the congressional schedule that tends to uh, lengthen things. Um, uh, Mr. Levitin, uh, you mentioned in your uh, testimony, um, uh, you mentioned OCC as an apt comparison uh, to the CFPB. Um, in Ms. Warren's testimony, she also mentions that as the appropriate comparison. Why, why do you believe that to be the case? One of the, one of the primary reasons that we separate, that Congress separated consumer finance from bank safety and soundness was that it found that those two did not work well together because safety and soundness always uh, took the, uh, the, the foremost position well, I mean, and you're, consumer you're protection ended up being subordinated. I, I understand. You're, you're, you're talking about the previous Congress, Congress's intent on this law, uh, on the structure of Dodd-Frank and, and CFPB in particular. What in particular, is, why is OCC uh, the appropriate comparison? Because OCC is the strongest of the Federal bank regulators, and if we want to have a bank regulator that is able to, uh, to act efficiently and decisively to protect American families, we want a structure that works like OCC. OCC has been a very effective structure in furthering banks' interests. We want a structure like that that furthers the interests of American okay. families. Uh, you, you speak that uh, the, these commission, the commission structure is not ideal. Why? When you have a commission structure, there are two reasons. First of all, just with any commission structure, you end up often having sim just simply horse trading among the commissioners. Commissioners have their pet issues, as Professor Zwicky pointed out, and uh, the result is that sometimes commission decisions end up being based 
on political trade-offs rather than what is really the right resolution of the issue. And you are saying this to Congress. I am saying this to Congress. <laughs> certainly, because Congress is a different structure and Congress is meant, yeah. is meant to I'm be sorry, political. I am sorry, your second agency. point. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I, but I think that is an important distinction. That Congress is a political agency and is meant to do that. We do not want our regulatory agencies operating that way. Okay, we want and your second point. The second point um, is that when you are dealing with that, the, the traditional model of a five-person agency, we don't have this always, but mo in most cases we have, uh, we have the, the rule that no more than three members of, the, of that five-person commission can be from any one party. The problem is when you apply that, uh, that, that partisan division to consumer financial protection, it doesn't work because consumer financial protection issues do not fall on partisan lines. <laughs> okay. Uh, th thank you. Um, it, it, it is interesting because when you are talking access to credit, it, it, there, is a, there is a division there. Mr. Zwicky, you mentioned in your testimony that um, the, the comparison to the FTC is the, the preferable one. Compare that to the, the OCC. I would like to sort of understand the, the difference here. If there uh, is a uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and that is exactly right. The Federal Trade Commission is the obvious uh, analogy here. I worked at the Federal Trade Commission uh, as the director of uh, the Office of Policy Planning. The Federal Trade Commission for a long time has had authority over some pockets of, uh, of uh, cons uh, consumer protection. And what we see is that the FTC is the model of how this, uh, how this should be done, uh, which is that it has an internal deliberative process where they can discuss the, the policy trade-offs. Too much consumer protection can be harmful to consumers. If you, you know, you, we could, Why we could, is that? We could make the foreclosure rate zero if we just said you couldn't get a mortgage. Um, what would and the so it, that be? People would keep their homes, so what would the impact of that be? People wouldn't be able to buy homes uh, Why? Uh, because they'd have to save up. They'd have to get cash before they could, could buy a home, for instance. Because or, people wouldn't lend to them if they could not reclaim right. their property is what you're saying. It, exactly right, right, exactly. And so, uh, um, uh, well, and, and so we could get, so, um, uh, so it, it, but there's a trade-off then. There is a trade-off between two good things, consumer protection and, and consumer choice, competition and lower prices. If you raise prices, the consumers get less okay. access to Does credit. Does the rest of the panel agree, just yes or no, that there are trade-offs in this? That, that, that just as Mr. Zawicki outlined. Dr. Evans, just yes or no? Or? Yes. Okay. Mr. Levitt? Yes, there are trade-offs. Yes. Vegas. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, uh, okay. Just want to understand. Oh, sir, thanks. Go right ahead. And elaborating on the FTC then, which is that what we see is the FTC, through the deliberative five-member process, comes up a way with, uh, with doing this. We also see at the FTC that there is an internal uh, check of competition, consumer choice on one side of the agency, consumer protection on the other side of the, uh, of the agency. And when I think about this, uh, and, and the FTC, nobody has ever said that the FTC um, is uh, uh, incompetent because they've got a, an agency. I never saw horse trading with respect to these sorts of things. What I saw was a deliberative process that had internal checks and balances that weighed all of the uh, considerations here. And when I think about the CFPB, what I think is that I was, I was at the FTC. I know a lot of people have worked at the FTC. And, and if people had said that consumers would be better off if we just took the uh, Consumer Protection Bureau of the FTC and spun it off and just let it sue whoever it wanted to, do any regulations it wanted to, without any consideration about uh, uh, other sorts of things, people would think you had lost your mind. Yet that is the model. That is the model for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau would be the FTC Consumer Protection Division standing alone. Okay. That would be, and that would be a, uh, a, a disaster. My time has expired. And, uh, Mr. Quigley of Illinois, the ranking member is recognized for five minutes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Lovett and Professor, uh, obviously a significant part of this new agency's mission is to help level the playing field between uh, the larger lenders and smaller lenders such as credit unions and small community banks in my district. Uh, you published, I believe, this report in December 2009 in which you made the point, quote, uh, better regulation and the consumer credit mar in the, of the consumer uh, marketplace would result in both safer and more affordable products. Uh, specifically, you mentioned the issue of incomplete price competition which makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for consumers to comparison shop for products based on total cost. Uh, would you explain the concept of incomplete price competition and the effect it has on a consumer finance market? 
Sure. I, 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 I want to start by saying I, I think that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau could end up being a major uh, source for uh, really could end up really benefiting uh, community banks and credit unions by leveling the competition playing field within the financial services space. That within financial services there are economies of scale. That especially in areas, let's say, uh, credit card, uh, credit cards and debit cards, there are simply economies of scale that smaller financial institutions cannot match. Having the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau encourage more transparent products where consumers are able to compare apples to apples, where they can see, where they don't have to try and guess what is it going to cost me to use this credit card over the course of a year, but they can know if I use this card, this will be the cost, and if I use this card, this will be the cost, and I can make an informed comparison, just like I go to the grocery store and I can look at unit prices, then I can make an informed comparison like that, then I can make sure that I choose the right product. And that lets smaller financial institutions that offer really good products and really good services be able to compete fairly because they don't, don't have to compete with hidden price terms. They, their price terms are upfront and clear, and, and part of their price terms are that they have excellent service. And often they have to compete with large financial institutions that have an incentive to, uh, to hide the, uh, the price terms in small print and make it hard to figure out what is it going to cost to use this product. You are talking about improving transparency. Very much so, sir. And exactly. If you were them, how do you do that? What are the steps and how does it so the everyday person can find what you are talking about? I think first and foremost you focus on uh, disclosure of information. That we have, we, the way we have done consumer protection in the United States since the Truth in Lending Act is focused on, primarily on disclosure. And you, try, and you try and improve the disclosure forms as the CFPB has already uh, started to do under, with uh, reconciling the uh, Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act and Truth in Lending Act disclosures for mortgages, started doing that with credit cards, trying to boil down you know, a typical 30-page credit card holder agreement into hopefully what will end up being a one-page agreement that you and I can look at and read in plain English and that you don't have to be a lawyer to understand. Is there some other place that you think this makes sense to disclose so it is not just in that? Is there some online possibilities? That is one of the possibilities. I mean, I, that, you know, this is not a, it is not clear exactly what the right answer is. Part of the, the task before the CFPB is going to be to figure out what is, the, what is the, what's the optimal way to do this. And I expect that the CFPB will consider, among other things, whether having online, you know, enabling online, easier online comparisons just the way you might compare used cars on CarMax or something would be, uh, would be an option. And your best guess on how the market reacts to this, these requirements? Well, you know, if I were a large financial institution and I made a lot of money by hiding, the, by hiding the price terms, I wouldn't like this. I would, be, I, I, would want, I would want to stop this and I would want to kill off this agency. But if I were a small financial institution that, you know, where my calling card was excellent uh, customer service and you know, straightforward, honest product, I would, li I would embrace this wholeheartedly. I mean, I don't we are already starting to see that. I don't fault them for trying to make profits. I, I just think it is something that the market always should encourage, and that is the competitive aspects that transparency allows. Um, so I would like to think that they uh, eventually embrace this and see it as an, a marketing, marketing opportunity. As you said, you know, like a Carfax, some people are advertising, hey, we make this easy for you to know what you are actually buying when you buy this car. So I would like to think that they would embrace it at some point, recognizing the cost and the, the competitive qualities that it would bring to bear against them in some respects. Transparency is the consumer's best friend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Dr. Evans, uh, you mentioned that your concern is that the CFPB would become, uh, would really put in place an anti-credit policy. Can you explain why that would be? Why, why would we have an agency with an anti-credit, anti-borrowing, anti-lending policy? on your microphone, Sorry. yes, sir. The, the philosophy of many of the people who are behind the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, uh, is really that there are some fundamental problems in um, the financial market. There is a belief um, that consumers really don't know what they are doing, that consumers make a lot of mistakes, and what you really need is you need a nanny, you need a super nanny, uh, in effect, to be telling consumers what they should be doing. How does that happen? Well, you basically tell financial institutions what kind of products um, uh, they should design, what kind of products they should offer to 
um, to consumers. Uh, if you look at the writings of a lot of the people involved in the agency, there is a tendency on their part um, to basically, basically believe that borrowing money is not a great thing and that consumers get sucked into borrowing too much. How do you react to that if you are an agency with those beliefs? Uh, you put policies in place to make it more difficult uh, for banks to lend money to consumers, and you put policies in place. And one of the things that has been suggested by some of the backers of the CFPB is basically um, what is known as sticky opt-out policies, where you basically tell a financial institution that they have to tell consumers that this is the product that, that, um, that we have to give you and make it very difficult for the financial institution to let that consumer take another product. Um, that basically makes it difficult for the financial institution to lend money to that, that consumer. If, if I might just elaborate just a little bit and respond to Professor right. Levitin's um, points. Um, I think history tells us that the notion that this regulatory agency is going to lower prices to consumers, that this massive regulatory agency is going to lower prices to consumers and is going to increase competition, I think is extraordinarily naive. And if you look at the facts, uh, we have had the experiment with the CARD Act. What have we seen as a result of the CARD Act? One of the effects of the CARD Act in this marketplace is that prices have gone up to consumers and it has been more difficult for consumers um, to get credit. Why is that? Because one of the things that the CARD Act does, and I am not saying the CARD Act doesn't do good things, but one of the things that the CARD Act does is it makes it very, very difficult for financial institutions um, to price risk. It is simply not the case um, that credit is like a car or is like a toaster. Um, the difference is that when a bank extends credit to Mr. Zwicky or Mr. Levitin or to me or to Mr. Pincus, the chances are each one of us has different risk characteristics and the bank has to figure out a way to price that. The CARD Act and, and that particular regulation made that more difficult to do, and one of the consequences of that is, is banks had to basically um, increase their prices and reduce the availability of, of credit. The, the other example that I have written on recently, of course, and we don't know how this is going to play out, um, is the Durbin Amendment and debit card, uh, debit card interchange fees. Uh, based on the work I have done, I think it is pretty clear, I think it is pretty clear from how the market has already operated that that is going to have a very clear effect on the marketplace. It is going to increase the price that consumers pay. I simply don't think it is plausible that this regulatory agency is going to result in lower prices for consumers. I just don't think there is a lot of experience in history um, that is uh, that's comported with that particular view. The FSOC, the ability of the FSOC to overrule the rules of the CFPB. Um, Ms. Warren says that this basically weakens the agency and it is not a strong regulatory agency because you have to get seven out of ten, really, excluding the director of the CFPB, seven out of nine members to vote, and the limitation on that overruling is that it would have a systemic, provide a systemic risk, risk to the American financial system. High hurdle. So that means the CFPB could really eliminate particular businesses and business lines, and the FSOC wouldn't have the authority to overrule it. Why is, uh, Mr. Mr. Pincus, you, you mentioned this in the, about the FSOC. Why is the FSOC um, not a powerful tool to, to overrule CFPB rules? I think for, for both of the reasons you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, first of all, the, the supermajority requirement uh, is very unlikely to be met. The standard that has to be applied is an extremely, I mean, the, threatens the entire U.S. financial system, incredibly high standard. Uh, second of all, uh, the process that's employed, I mean, typically uh, the way agencies discuss uh, proposed regulations is there is a process before the rule is issued. What this says is the Bureau issues its rule and then if somebody doesn't like it, they can start what will be a very public process to overrule it. And I think there will be obvious uh, reasons why, uh, absent something that is almost so cataclysmic it is impossible to think about, nobody is going to want to do that. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. And with that, I yield to Mr. Cummings for five minutes. Thank you very much. I was, as I was sitting and listening to you, Dr. Evans, and you, Mr. Pincus, I could not help but think about um, a rap group that has a song entitled Get Rich or Die Trying. And the reason why I say that is that um, I want to do everything in my power to protect my constituents who are suffering every day and the constituents of Mr. McHenry, by the way, Chairman McHenry and others. And we need to 
we need to – I don't want us to throw up our hands and say we can't protect consumer, consumers because we can do it and we can do it effectively and efficiently, and I am sure that is what you are all talking about, trying to get to that. You may be, have a disconnect from the people that I see every day who pay the high bank fees and who have been messed over over and over and over again. And they go to work, they get on the early bus at 5.30 in the morning. They scrub other people's floors, operate the elevators, and then pay these high fees. Why? One of the reasons banks won't even locate in their areas. Pay their loans all throughout the district. People who uh, uh, rent them appliances that they could buy. You know, that's why we need this, this protection, uh, CFPB. And we all need to work to make it work because the American people are paying for this and they, de they deserve to be protected and they need protection. Professor Levinson, you published an academic paper in 2009 entitled A Critique of Evans and Wright's Study of the Consumer Financial Protection Agency Act, which was a critique of a study by David Evans, who is one of our guest panelists today, and Joshua Wright, that found, among other things, that the CFPA Act, the section of the Dodd-Frank that created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, could increase interest rates and reduce new jobs. You explained that their report was just the latest phony, and I'm going to quote you. I don't want them to think I'm saying this about them. Just quote the, the latest phony lobby statistics to come out of the banking industry, end of quote and pointed out that the study was funded by the American Bankers Association. Is that correct? Did you do that? It is correct. And my particular objection with that paper was that it tried to estimate the in an increase in the cost of credit due to the C creation of the CFPA, um, to the CFPB, and its methodology was this. And you will see, I mean, it will be very obvious the flaw in this methodology. It said, here is another piece of legislation dealing with interstate bank regulation and one study found that resulted in an increase of cost of credit of X basis points. Therefore, the CFPB will result in an increase in the cost of credit of X times some number they pulled out of the air. And it was simply that. Just take a multiplier and apply that multiplier to an, uh, to an inapposite study and say that is going to be the effect of the CFPB. I was rather shocked because Mr. Uh, Dr. Evans has produced some really excellent academic work previously, and this was just uh, very surprising for me to see. Uh, just let me ask one other question, then I'll get to you, Dr. Evans. Because I want no, you go ahead. Because I want to be fair to you. Uh, with, with all due respect, um, sure. uh, Professor Levitin um, hasn't done any research. He just testified concerning what's going to happen to prices based on absolutely nothing. Um, when pressed to say what's going to happen to interest rates and so forth, you know the reaction we get, and I, I'll quote from his testimony just earlier: um, "It's speculative. We don't really know." Um, what Josh and I, uh, Professor Wright and I, tried to do is a, was a study. Uh, it was not based on perfect evidence, um, but but the uh, particular study that that um, Professor Levitin has pointed to is actually an, a an analog, the best analog we could find, not a perfect analog, best analog we could find of something that is comparable to the CFPB. It provided a baseline for the imposition of credit uh, in the economy. That particular study that Professor Levitin has just referred to showed that another regulatory bill, um, and as a result of state restrictions on uh, banking and credit and so forth, led to an 80 basis point increase in interest rates. That is what you typically get with regulation. We did a comparison to CFPB and made the point that CFPB would um, allow a greater um, set of regulatory restrictions on lending than that. We took that as a base. As a base. I, I got to cut you off because I got to give Levinson a sure. chance to respond. You just, they, you just they took that 80, that 80 basis points, and would you multiply it by two or three or just some number that was yanked out of the air? We, we and that's not scholarship. Wait, hold on, let me just, go that's simply not scholarship. Just to yank a number out of the air and say this study was 80 basis points, therefore CFPB is going to be 160. You can't do that. It's it, this one's 80 basis points, and we just don't know yet with the CFPB. We have to give it a chance to before we find out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I recognize Mr. Ginter for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Evans, did you pull a number out of the air? 
No. If you read the paper and, and if you look at our response to Professor Levitin, which we, 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 we can certainly make available um, to you, um, we use that as a baseline of 80 basis point, mm -hmm. um, and we couched it in very careful language. We said that um, uh, this isn't accurate, this is the best we can do given the available evidence, um, and we gave the reader um, an explanation as to why they could, should consider multiples of 80 basis points, twice that or three times that, based on a very lengthy analysis that we did in the paper, pages and pages explaining why the CFPA, why the CFPB um, has the powers and has the likelihood, of, particularly the, the earlier version of the, of the legislation, um, to increase interest rates. Again, with all due respect to Professor Levitin, he has produced absolutely nothing on this topic. The notion that we are uh, engaging in this exercise of creating this massive agency and the best we can get is we will just have to see. Um, for me, that is not good enough. Uh, and thank you for that testimony. I, I would concur that it is not good enough for Congress either, or it shouldn't be good enough for Congress either. This is not a, um, <clears throat> a, a, a notion. Th this issue is, not, is too important for us to guesstimate how to solve the problem. I think all members of Congress want to solve the problem, uh, but I have failed to see yet how this agency will correct the actions uh, that led up to um, what you, Mr. Levitin, had talked about um, that, that built up to this. So I, the one question I guess I would have for you, um, I, I think that you had made some statements that if the uh, CFPB had existed from 2004 to 2008, um, this could have been averted. It may not have occurred. I heard that testimony earlier uh, in the first panel as well. So my question would be, even though this entity is supposedly going to have some uh, responsibilities of other entities that, that should have prevented this or should have maybe um, uh, suggested this was going to occur and we, we could have put some stopgap measures into place, can you tell me what exactly this agency will do, say, in the next 12 months? to ensure that this would not happen again? Well, Congress already took care of a lot of the, uh, of the first steps itself. Mm -hmm. Title 14 of the Dodd-Frank Act uh, undertook a major reform of, the more of, the, of mortgage lending markets, including a requirement that for non-qualified mortgages, which is a term that regulators are going to have to define, that, uh, there had, that lenders will have to verify ability to repay. That seems like a pretty obvious first step, and I'm glad Congress took it. Um, I think it is very important to, uh, to note that the major step forward with the CFPB is, an, is, a, is, a, is changing the regulatory architecture. Previously, when, ba when bank safety and soundness was, uh, was yoked together with consumer protection, consumer protection always ended up being the subordinated mission, mm -hmm. and, and uh, entities like the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency would routinely turn a blind eye to predatory lending practices because they were profitable and they didn't, want to, you know, they didn't want to stop the music at the party. The CFPB would, does not have that bank profitability mission. It is not tasked with, insure, with maximizing bank profitability. And therefore, it is an agency that is incentivized to make sure that there is good consumer protection. Yeah, but, but wasn't that, that, quote, good consumer protection, didn't that exist in these other agencies? The, their, their missions were not to have bank profitability. Sure they were. They were tasked with bank safety and soundness, and a bank that is not profitable is not safe and sound. So I don't know sole, the definition so of bank safety okay, and soundness that isn't about profitability. So, so you are you're, you're saying their sole focus was bank profitability. There was nothing, no protections, no concern, no issue uh, with respect to the consumer? Virtually none. And I, I, I can give you some examples. The Federal Reserve had the power under the Home Equity uh, Protection Act to Home, Homeowners Equity Protection Act, HOPA, to pass regulations that would have curbed some of the worst abuses of subprime lending. It didn't act for over a decade. Would Fannie and Freddie fall into this category that you refer to? Fannie and Freddie are a complicated and rather sad side story to this. The, re the real problem in the home lending market was from the private label securitization area, and that then spilled over into Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie were really not, were not government agencies. They weren't tasked with consumer protection, and FIFA, the OFIO, um, was not ta particularly tasked with consumer protection either. Okay. Uh, I know my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
the ranking member is uh, Mr. Quigley is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Evans, Professor Levin, and I actually appreciate the, the disagreements here. Uh, our judicial system is built on zealous advocates disagreeing because from that we would like to think we move toward the truth. So toward that end, while I recognize we are not going to hold hands and sing kumbaya here, uh, it is good to see this warm and fuzzy moment. Uh, Dr. Evans, the professor's comments about transparency, while you may disagree with much of what this agency is about, could you talk about how transparency might help this industry, and if you agree, or what parts of transparency might improve uh, things from the consumer's point of view without, as you would be unhappy with, destroying competition? Yeah, no, that that's a very fair question, and I and I appreciate it. And let, let me let me take that and just start out by saying that I, I'm certainly not suggesting that there aren't problems to be solved. I mean, there there are a ton of problems um, in the lending industry. There are certainly lots of problems that consumers have faced, and I'd be the last person to deny that the set of, there's a set of problems that some agency needs to needs to deal with. Um, one of the things that is beneficial for consumers, you know, subject to qualifications is transparency. It is not a good thing when banks hide the ball. Um, it is not a good thing when, um, when consumers are tricked into doing things. And uh, it is certainly the case that there are some members of the financial services industry um, that have acted badly. Um, and I am the last person to suggest um, that this is, you know, everything is okay and that there are no, um, that there are no problems. Um, so I am in favor of consumer protection, consumer financial protection. I think this agency could do um, lots of good things. Um, the one qualification, I guess, the thing that I would really like to get across is that, um, as with many things, um, you know, we have to have a perspective on the marketplace. And by and large, um, this is an industry that does a lot of great things. Um, it, it helps the people in Mr. Cummings' districts in <coughs> lots of ways. Um, and we just have to have the perspective that while there are bad things going on that we need to take care of, it is also an industry that does a great deal of good for consumers and small businesses. And the regulation that we have for this industry needs to be conscious of both the bad things that are going on, but it also needs to really recognize that the bad things are often exceptions um, and that there are lots of good things that we need to make sure we, we don't harm. So would, would you suggest that the bad things you talked about are in large part um, undertaken by what was de deemed the shadow banking industry? I mean, when, when this bill was being discussed, many of the largest financial institutions were, were supportive of a they weren't for this agency, but were they, they were certainly for somebody going after the problems from what was deemed the shadow banking industry. <clears throat> um, if, if you want to use a different term, that is fine. No. I am um, hesitating here because um, um, I think probably one of the things that Professor Levitt and I agree on is that some of the large financial institutions um, uh, engaged in practices that um, you know probably weren't a great thing for 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 consumers. So there are elements of the of the financial services industry, whether it's it's large, whether it's shadow, and so forth. Um, you know there are certainly um, issues, and those issues I think should be appropriately uh, dealt with. So I don't want to draw this dividing line between big financial institutions and and the shadow financial institutions because the shadow financial institutions. Um, while we think of them as charging very high prices, in some cases they are also meeting a consumer need um, for people that aren't able to get loans from the large financial institutions but actually have a need that need, needs to be served. So again, I don't want to suggest that there aren't problems there, but we also need to recognize that just because we say payday lender, um, that uh, not all payday lenders are doing bad things um, and not helping um, uh, consumers. Well, I appreciate your candor, and I would suggest to all the witnesses here uh, that kind of candor helps us get to the truth in the end, because uh, there will be another day and another issue and another bill. And in the end, what we are all trying to do is, is help all of our constituents. So, Dr. Evans, that helps. Thank you, and I yield back. I now recognize Mr. Genta for five minutes.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to follow up with both uh, Mr. Zwicky and Mr. Pincus on a couple of quick items. Um, first, Mr. Zwicky, I, look, I understand the notion of appropriate consumer protection. I think most of us do. Um, I, I think all of us probably agree that there is either redundancies or even uh, in some circumstances um, um, additional burdens in some regulatory requirements. Uh, I, I think even some of us would agree with this philosophy or notion of a CFPB. I, I have great concerns about the structure. I have great concerns about the ultimate uh, power that can be uh, provided to uh, this one individual and to you know, the individuals within this organization. I have serious concerns about um, the, the, uh, the, the funding of the, of the agency and the lack of ability for this agency to be called in front of Congress. Um, so, and I think those are concerns that anybody in Congress should have, because ultimately people in this country are going to rely on Congress to make sure that the right things are being done. So my question to you would be in two parts, I guess. Could you talk a little bit about how this agency is structured and maybe some of the problems we, we should consider or, or, or see in the future? And then secondly, what alternatives do exist or can exist rather than the, the, the structure that we have um, that has been outlined in, in Dodd Frank? Thanks. Um, again, I, I think the Federal Trade Commission is the obvious model for how this thing should have been set up. In fact, I think all these duties should have just been given to the Federal Trade Commission and uh, we could have all gone home at that point and they would have done the, the right job. And, uh, um, and I think the Federal Trade Commission, where again I worked from 2003 to 2004, is a much stronger, uh, capable, uh, um, effective agency precisely because of the, all of the, the apparatus that is set up around it, uh, multi-member commission, internal checks and balances, congressional oversight, all those sorts of things makes that agency much better. Uh, an agency that lacks all that um, is prone to tunnel vision um, and sort of navel-gazing and that sort of thing and just sort of uh, losing its way. So I, I would strongly urge that this be reformulated along the lines of the FTC. I mean, fundamentally, if this is the right thing here, then the FTC is wrong. And I don't think anybody right. thinks the FTC is wrong. Can, can you expand a little bit on the commission? Why does the uh, CFPB not have a commission? Why, why does it have a commission? And, and it, does that suggest that the other commissions are not necessary? It seems to suggest that all the other, if this is right, then all the other ones are wrong. And that just doesn't seem plausible to me. I mean, it doesn't, if, if this is how we're supposed to set up consumer protection, then I guess you need to wipe out the FTC, which has been here since 1914, and replace it with a uh, director rather than a commission. And the OCC is not analogous to the all. The OCC is safety and soundness. It basically does accounting. Um, it doesn't do broad scale policy analysis of the sort of things we have here. So let's, let me give, give an example, if I may. I, I agree with, totally with Mr. Cummings about his concerns yeah. with respect to access to credit. But if you think about the combination of CFPB, the Durbin Amendment, the Credit, uh, credit Card Act, that sort of thing, we are going to drive, because of the Durbin Amendment, um, maybe a million consumers out of the mainstream banking system. CFPB, by increasing the regulatory uh, um, uh, uh, burdens here, is going to drive more consumers out of the mainstream banking system. We are going to put them exactly in the hands of the payday lenders and the check cashers and everybody else. We have already seen this. When you go after the payday lenders, what happens is that payday lending migrates online. And then you got online payday lending. You go after payday lending, people migrate to pawn shops. And we are talking about a situation where when you go in with good intentions, you end up hurting the people you intend to, to help. And that is what I am concerned that is going to happen with this. And then, Mr. Pink, is to follow up a little bit, um, I, I don't know that you heard earlier testimony, but I have got some concerns about OCC versus CFPB. I believe there are clear differences between the two. Uh, would, would you, could you talk a little bit about the differences uh, between the OCC and the CFPB in terms of um, oversight? The, the clearest difference, uh, Congressman, is that the controller serves at the pleasure of the President and the director doesn't. The director can only be uh, dismissed for, I think the statute says, inefficiency, ne neglect of duty or malfeasance, so a much more restrictive standard. So in terms of the checks of the elected officials, uh, much less of a check than on the OCC, than on the controller. And within the Treasury Department, the Secretary does also have some ability to oversee what the controller does. Again, the statute completely clear that the Federal, Federal Reserve has zero role with respect to what the director does. So those are, are the key differences, I think. 
I, I appreciate that because that that's uh, completely different than testimony we heard earlier today. Earlier today, we had heard that uh, they're they're similar, if not identical. And, and I, dis I I would I would agree with you that that primary function of responsibility and in, in how you can be hired and how you can be fired is, is, is paramount to the job uh, that you uh, are uh, expected to uh, to complete. I thank the chairman for the time. I thank the uh, the vice chair. I appreciate that. Mr. Cummings is recognized for five minutes. Yeah, I'm listening to all of this, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I, it's so easy to uh, forget how we got here. You know, we can have testimony to paint over the past and uh, talk about. My mother used to tell us, don't concentrate on what you don't have, concentrate on what you do have. And um, I've been listening. And I'm just trying to, you know, thinking about $20 billion in credit card penalty fees, talking about $38 billion in overdraft fees. And I'm trying to figure out where do we think this money comes from? It's coming from regular, everyday citizens. And Dr. Evans, you, I heard what you said about, you know, the fact that these uh, people who will rent you a washing machine for seventy-five dollars a month, when you could possibly buy one for three hundred fifty dollars, particularly in this kind of economy, that they're doing a service. And one of the things that Ms. Warren did, talked about today is trying to give people information. And um, I think information is power. I really do. But it's powerful when you use it. In some kind of way in this country, we have got to get to the point where we don't let the little guy and lady go down the tubes. Some kind of way we got to get there. Because you know what? Because you're going to always have, I live in the inner, inner, inner city of Baltimore, so I see it every day. They don't have the big fancy cars. They may have a car that's five or six years old. They're making extremely high car payments. They're paying extremely high rent for what they're getting. They pay the most for food. And the food is not very good. And then, and they are constantly digging into a hole that gets deeper and deeper, while the folks, a lot of the folks who get these fees, they move out into the suburbs, into the mansions. And then these folks who are getting up at 5.30 in the morning, paying all these fees to these people who you say are doing them a, a great favor, um, they can't do for their children, they can't take for, care of their children with the, the way they'd like to or even close. And they find themselves in gener generational cycles going down, down, down instead of going up, up, up. That's why I go to every graduation I can get to and beg people to get an education. Because you're going to broaden the hat between the haves and the have-nots because, again, the people who don't have pay the most, and they are the ones in most instances that get royally screwed. So I'm just here representing my constituents, trying to make sure that we find a way out of this. And so this organization was not, the CFPB was not established to just um, be something fancy and you know, to be able to say we did something. We wanted to make sure, by the way, without hardly, I don't think we got one Republican vote. We wanted to make sure that we did something to take care of all of our constituents. I don't care where they live. And so then the question becomes is how do you take the, this and make it work well so that those people don't keep going in a downward cycle? So that because they cannot afford the things that they need because they just paid 
$20 billion in credit card penalty fees if they can get an, a, a, a credit card, of course, and $30 billion in overdraft fees. So how do we make it work? You, you guys are the geniuses. You're the gurus. I mean, what do you say to my constituents if they have a television? <clears throat> so I, um, personally, I have a lot of sympathy for your constituents, and I understand, I understand the, the, the problems that they, um, that they face. And I wish I could tell you that I was here today and I could give you the solution to all the problems that you have laid out. I think all of us would like to, uh, would like to solve them. I guess the one thing I would say maybe to just put a little bit of perspective on it um, is if you go 20 years ago, um, many of your constituents who now have credit cards probably wouldn't have been able to get them. One of the things that's happened over the last 20 years is more socially and economically disadvantaged people have been able to get credit cards. Um, they have been able to get bank accounts, um, and that's actually helped them out. Um, um, one of the areas that I have worked on quite a bit, Congressman Cummings, um, not recently but a long time ago, was minority businesses. Um, I am sure you have minority businesses. A lot of them. I am sure you have a lot of them. And one of the problems that, that they faced 20 years ago is um, if they wanted to get financing on their credit cards, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, they would have had great difficulty doing that. They are now able to do that now. So I am not suggesting that your constituents don't have, you know, deep problems that need to be solved. I, I guess I would like to um, maybe persuade you a little bit um, that some of these financial services products, whether it is bank accounts and debit cards or, or credit cards, while there may be aspects of it that, that are, um, um, you see as bad, I guess I would like to persuade you that there is an aspect of them that has actually been pretty good um, for your constituents and that it has actually gotten better uh, over time. And finally, I will just point out that my wife is from Baltimore and she will be amused when I go home and tell her uh, that you compared me to uh, anything involving rap. <laughs> well, thank I see you. My and, time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are going to do a final round here. Mr. Gint is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I um, happened to, in the last month or so, visit uh, Beach Street School in the inner city of Manchester, New Hampshire. Now, many people think of New Hampshire not as an inner city. As a, as, a, as the home to an inner city, but um, it has many uh, inner cities, many neighborhoods that are in inner cities. I would happen to be mayor for four years of that city and have great compassion for um, those who are um, financially and socially challenged in this uh, society. So I think it is imperative and important for us to make sure that we have rules in place that allow a level playing field that allow any individual, um, if he or she chooses, to succeed in life. Um, I, I am often reminded of some of the uh, kids that go to uh, the Boys and Girls Club in my hometown of Manchester, New Hampshire, and where they started and where they are today. And I am proud to be part of um, a, a family of constituents and community members who feel very strongly that it is our responsibility as Americans to lead by example, to ensure that the American dream is alive and well, and that anyone who wants a part of that American dream can reach for that American dream. So I guess my question would be this to Mr. Zwicky. If there was an alternative that you would suggest would enhance that type of America, that I could co-sponsor with the gentleman from Baltimore, and I'd be happy to do it because I have great respect for him. I've watched him serve um, with passion and compassion, and I admire uh, his approach uh, to trying to help his constituents. And I want to be part of that solution. So if there was a piece of legislation that Congress could embrace in a bipartisan way, to make that American dream, whether it is in Baltimore or, or Manchester, come true, what would it be? Um, but, but I, I certainly think you know, incrementally the things that are on the table, I endorse all those, the multi-member commission, that sort of thing. But what I would urge this panel to think about going forward, because the CFPB will likely turn out to be a failure uh, if it is not, if, if these accountability issues are not fixed, 
this thing's going to run off the rails uh, and it's going to be a job killer and it's going to raise the cost of credit and everything else and it's going to and it's going to hurt the people it's specifically intended to help. So hopefully that will <clears throat> that's unfortunate, <clears throat> but I think that's entirely predictable. I hope that causes people to reexamine this. And let me stress again, I think that there is a urgent need and a great opportunity <clears throat> for a new approach to consumer financial protection. In my testimony, I talk about the difference between market reinforcing regulation on one hand and market replacing regulation on the other hand. I am all for and uh, savvy regulation that makes use of technology, uh, harnesses the power of competition and consumer choice. Um, a lot of the things that this agency might do, like a, like a simplified mortgage disclosure form would be great. Um, going back and paring back some of the, uh, uh, the mountains of junk that has been attached to the Truth in Lending Act would be great. My concern is, is that in order to bring about a heightened co competition and consumer choice, we, we could do that. Doing things like creating vague, open-ended standards of liability, like the ability to sue somebody for an abusive product because a, a somebody in Washington thinks that somebody out there is too stupid to be able to understand the products that they're uh, that they're purchasing, not based on anything that I that I can tell. That's not going to that's not going to help people. I and mean, we know the, the the concern I have is both for middle class people to be able to, to, to have choice and competition, and I'm concerned about uh, lower income people who, have, who already have very limited credit options, and if we have a regulator that takes away options from people who already have limited options, that's not a very good way of making those people's lives better off. And we know this even just from regulating payday lending. When you get rid of payday lending, what happens? Evictions go up, bounce checks go up. Um, uh, utili uh, utility shutoffs all go up uh, in a situation like that. And so I think that the desire for Washington bureaucrats to think that they know better about how consumers uh, and people live their lives, I think, is a, is, is a folly. And I would think that we want to go in a completely different direction uh, towards uh, competition and consumer choice. Uh, thank you. I yield back to the chairman. The ranking member is recognized for five minutes. First of all, I want to thank the gentleman from New Hampshire for his kind words, I, and I really mean that. I, thank you. Um, trying to figure out uh, where do we? Uh, you were talking, Dr. Evans, about um, helping folks who helping minority contractors. One of the things that I've noticed is that when we pull together minority contracts, and not just minority contractors, others too, one of the things that they talked about is just in light of all the problems we have been experiencing with the economy, just being able to get, to get credit. A lot of them had opportunities, but they couldn't even get a line of credit or the line of credit was canceled. And, you know, for some of these small firms, a $10,000 line of credit is as I'm sure you well know if you've worked with minority contractors, that can be, I mean, that's like worth a million dollars just to get from pay day to pay day and whatever. And I was just, you know, and I was wondering, as Mr. Gento was talking, I was just thinking to myself, this other question, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of organizations now that are uh, spending a lot of energy and effort in this whole thing of, uh, financial literacy. And I'm just wondering, you know, how much that plays in. Mr. Ginter very sincerely said he's trying to find solutions, as I am. <clears throat> and I wonder how much value that has, because I do believe that sometimes people don't know how to handle money. Some, some folks, they don't know. They just have never been taught um, in balancing checkbooks. I mean, if you got fees, you know, for balancing checks, I remember one, somebody told me once, a uh, banker said something to the effect that if people stopped bank, bouncing checks, he would be out of business. I, mean, I think he was exaggerating a little bit, but, I mean, that's a lot of money. And you know how what happens, you bounce one, and because that one bounces, then you, you got a whole series of bouncing, and next thing you know, you're going to bounce all the way around the world. So I'm just wondering, you know, there's a certain part of it is that is, is personal responsibility and but as my mom used to say, it's nothing like a person who don't know what they don't know. And I was just wondering how significant a role do you think that plays in trying to help people? I know there's some people 
that may be informed they just don't have the resources but there are other people that want i mean maybe if they were taught at an early age that a penny uh, saved is a penny well however it goes you know you if you hold on to it you in good shape uh, <laughs> so what i was just wondering so, so, so you're asking economists whether we ought to um, have uh, more economic construction in the schools and more right. That's literacy. right. That's right. Yes, we yeah. we, abs we absolutely we absolutely should. Do you I think, think it helps a lot? I, I, if it's I, done right, I, I do. I, I actually think there there is is not enough um, instruction in the school systems on um, uh, how finances work, how the economy works, and I think probably that's something that Adam and I um, probably agree on. That getting more of that. Um, in society, both both in the school system and, and generally in society, uh, would be a good thing. I know that's one of the things that the CFPB is supposed to be doing, and I think I would applaud them for uh, for doing that. So I think that that would be helpful. I think it would be helpful for your constituents, and I think it would be helpful, frankly, for um, a lot of people. Uh, if I could just quickly comment on the first part of your remarks, yeah. though, concerning the minority um, contractors, um, uh, I absolutely hear you. I mean, th th I, I know tons of businesses. Uh, in the last few years have had their lines of credits um, canceled. And it's a very tough time the last few years for, for small businesses. Um, what we need to do in order to fix that problem is we need to get um, money flowing um, to small businesses um, to, get them, to get them moving again. And you know, there, this probably isn't the right opportunity to go into all the reasons why they're not getting it. Um, but one par problem um, is some of the capital uh, requirements that, that banks, and in particular community uh, banks have. As you probably know, community banks are the, one of the major sources of lending for um, small businesses. So there are a multitude of problems uh, that I think minority and other small businesses face at this point that we could probably um, give some attention to. I'll be in contact with you on that. Mr. Levinson. Uh, briefly, to, first to address the, uh, the constriction of uh, capital to small businesses, it's important to note that that constriction of capital happened before any federal, a new federal regulation went into place. Mm -hmm. That started in the fall of 2000, really in the fall of 2008 in particular. And that was the result of a lack of regulation. Not, that was not caused by regulation. And I think we need to keep that in mind. As far as financial literacy, you know, it's hard to argue against it, except the evidence there is really not very convincing. There isn't real good evidence that it works. And it, if you stop and think about it for a second, of course it doesn't. You, you know, I think I'm pretty financially literate, and I guarantee you there are a lot of lawyers around at Mr. Pincus's firm and other firms who can draft forms that I will not understand. And they're paid very well to do it, and I know that because I used to be paid to do that. <laughs> Gentlemen's time's expired. I recognize myself for the final I recognize myself for the final five minutes of the day. Um, that is by far the most shocking thing that I've heard here today, that financial literacy doesn't matter. That is insane. I, I, with all due respect, I would tell you that if I look at a form and I say it's too complex for me to understand, I will not sign it, right? And it, it's, it's a skepticism that additional bit of financial literacy goes in. I, and I'm not trying to, to attack you. I, but look, I, maybe your point is that financial literacy isn't going to fix everything. I mean, I, I would accept that. Sure. Okay. Uh, you know, not every, uh, you know, unfortunately, not everyone is as skeptical as you are. I, right. I, I wish that were the case. But there skepticism, are those that are more financially literate. But than skepticism all of us in the is room, not so. financial literacy. It's just skepticism. Right. Okay. Well, I understand. So maybe we should teach skepticism. I think that would be a very good thing. Right. To skeptical American public. Um, look, uh, I, I do want to ask a few questions that, that I, I want to better understand. Um, uh, there are two. two to, well, the, the, the headline of this, this hearing was who's watching the watchman. Let's get back to that, right? I don't want to lose sight of this, this kerfuffle with uh, uh, Ms. Warren earlier today because she wanted to leave. I, I, I think the American people have a lot of questions about this bureau. Uh, people that are providing credit, those that are accessing credit, those that hope to borrow, those that uh, are trying to have a business providing some level of lending, either short-term, long-term, whatever it may be, have a lot of questions about this bureau. Uh, and it's very clear that Ms. Warren is not intent on, on being very forthright about her ideas for this. Um, uh, and so that's why we have an expert panel to get a diversity of views. Mr. Zwicky, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, Inspector General, so would it be helpful to have a special Inspector General 
for the CFPB? Yes. Dr. Evans? Yes. Mr. Leventon? I would need to think about that issue further. I am happy to submit written comments on it. Certainly. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Pincus? I think I would like to think about it. I mean, the Fed, the Fed Inspector General has that job now, and I think the question that you are asking is, 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 should it be a more focused focus? What, what would you think of that? I think I should talk to my client before I get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. Um, Cost-benefit analysis, okay, uh, OIRA. Right? So we have an enormous swath of our government. The greater portion of our government is required to actually do a solid cost-benefit analysis. There is a lot of oversight and balance for that. Do you think it will be appropriate and helpful that uh, the CFB be, su be sub uh, subject to OIRA? Absolutely, yes. Um, Why? Independent agencies often are, are typically are not subjected to OIRA oversight. But the reason is, is because they are multi-member commissions. And so you basically substitute that accountability and that internal deliberative process where you essentially go through a cost-benefit analysis like we did at the, at the Federal Trade Commission. This has neither of those. And so uh, um, if you are not going to have at least a multi-member commission, you, you need to have something like OIRA. We have been talking most of the time here about the inherent trade-off between uh, higher costs and consumer protection access to credit, consumer protection, those sorts of things, and, and a serious, rigorous external check uh, and cost-benefit analysis, I think, would be, would be very valuable, unlike the sort of haphazard thing that is in there now. Dr. Evans, you mentioned it in your testimony. Um, would you comment? Uh, well, y yes, if it is done seriously. Okay. So, uh, you know, what, what would you point to as a, a good, good way of cost-benefit analysis being done? Um, is it currently being done in government, period? Yeah, this is not an area that I am an expert on. Maybe okay. Todd knows more about it than I do. My, my sure. impression is that it is not currently being done very well anywhere. <laughs> Mr. Levitin. I, I would concur with, with, with uh, Dr. Evans that the current OIRA process is a bit of a disaster. It ends up being mainly a cost analysis, not a cost benefit analysis. I would note that would be helpful, though. Um, well, I would note that the, stat the CFPB statute itself requires a cost-benefit analysis and that if the CFPB's analysis is not good, it can be challenged in court. Uh, and, and, and so it already has that baked in. I'm not sure that OIRA really does anything except create an obstacle for uh, government action. Thank you. Mr. Pincus? Well, I, I think it would be great. I, I think what OIRA does is bring some external rigor both to the cost-benefit analysis, but also brings other policy voices to the table. I mean, the, one of the values of the OIRA process is it is not just the agency that is pushing the, that is prom proposing the rule. It is the whole government that gets a chance to, to have input. And that is what you want in an area where you have got such conflicting, uh, not necessarily conflicting, but a multitude of policy interests. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, to, to the point of cost-benefit analysis, it is currently required for the CFPB for small institutions. It is not across the board, is my understanding. So. Um, my understanding is that for, uh, under the CFPB's uh, unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices that it is included. But, uh, I, you know, I, without looking, having sure. the statute before me, I would I believe it is sort of an internal uh, cost-benefit analysis. OIRA review is only for the small business uh, okay. provisions, That's I think. One, so, one, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. I was ahead. just going to say, Mr. Chairman, one, one problem is uh, all the things we are talking about only apply to rules. And what Ms. Warren has said, and certainly what other agencies such as the FTC have done, have basically uh, set standards through enforcement actions. And so I think another whole area of important discussion is where an enforcement position gets taken and either through settlement or whatever becomes uh, something that is prevailed on. What, what is the check on that as something that then legitimate businesses are going to say, hey, I better start complying with this, even though it is one enforcement action, I could be next? Well, that was one of my questions of Ms. Warren is about the relationship to the mortgage settlement. It is very clear that they were not intent on communicating very, very much of what they are doing, and their agency is not even up and running. So it is a great concern that we have is that there are not internal controls within this agency, whereas a, a, a balanced uh, uh, approach would have, would have had a, a board oversee it, even like Ms. Warren's original proposal, to, to be quite frank about it, where there will be internal debate and um, wrestling with rulemaking rather than one director simply doing it. The, the, the additional thing that is clear from today is that C, the CFPB will neither 
increase access to credit, nor reduce the cost of credit. That is for certain, and I think there's wide agreement on that. I would say further that it's also clear um, that the current uh, special assistant, the, the assistant to the president, and assistant to the Treasury Secretary, Ms. Warren, has been calling the shots at organizing this bureau. Uh, it's been a rather um, uh, less than transparent operation, if we can be very direct about it. Her answers were less than forthcoming, and they raised more questions than they actually provide answers. That's, that is uh, what, what we've learned over the, the course of the last three hours in this committee room. I certainly appreciate uh, this. Um, panel's testimony. Thank you for uh, waiting through the afternoon, and thank you for your uh, forthrightness and, and uh, willingness to sort of engage in this discussion, because it's enormously important not simply to policymakers in Washington, not simply to academics or, or, or business folks, but to the small p business person who hopes the small person, uh, in, in another of my colleagues' terms, uh, who wants to start a business. My dad, who wanted to start a business out of the garage, and he started that business on a credit card, something he, would, he told me to never do, except for that business put five kids through college, put a you know, roof over our head and an opportunity. And so I want to make sure that people have access to credit, whether it's a person that's trying to make it to the next paycheck or the person who has an aspirational goal of employing people and growing this economy. That's really what it's all about. And we can have a debate about how you achieve it, but this CFPB is not the construct to make that more available, uh, achieve greater opportunities for those individuals that we care so much about. Thank you for your testimony. I certainly appreciate uh, your willingness to be here today. And this meeting is now adjourned.